Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, you can support at patreon.com slash tawahido. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. You can also subscribe to the newsletter either for free or $5 a month at aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M dot substack.com. Today, my wonderful guest is Salit Gabayo Baharu and Devin Nashili. Long time. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> um, so I think we can begin with some politics and then I think we can pitch our, our new Giz class at the end because I think that'll be an exciting, an exciting note that will be more positive no matter what than things on the ballot. Things on the ballot in California are interesting because, you know, different states in the United States have various powers and we the people in California get a little bit more say than some of the other states. And I know some of them are related to criminal justice, which the reform and abolition thereof are at least interesting ideas that you and I have discussed a lot off camera. But before we get into the specific ballots, if we can, just in a, in a brief biographical sense, could you, could you tell us a little bit about your education and, and how you got passionate about these issues in the first place? Sure. Um, so I would say it was definitely not a straightforward path. I experimented a lot. I mean, I changed my major five times as an undergraduate, you know, and so I was literally all over the place. But I think I ultimately decided on studying economics for my undergraduate, thinking that I wanted to do economic development with the goal of going back to Ethiopia. I mean, I think for many of us in the diaspora, we're always trying to find ways to, you know, uh, empower ourselves here so that we could give back in some form or shape like back home. And so for me, it was um, my intention of studying economics at the time was to get into economic development. But I think I became quickly disillusioned uh, when I learned about the controversies involved with aid organizations, you know, mm. and I'm not going to get too much into it. <laughs> and so, and you know, the speed by which they operate was definitely not satisfying to me. Um, and so at that point, I then realized, you know, what would be the most efficient way of solving poverty um, and increasing social equity, right? And so, and then I dabbled into like, you know, the idea of social entrepreneurship and all of that good stuff. And then um, I think ultimately, ended up um, taking up gigs in San Diego, like working with refugees through the International Rescue Committee and in Chicago, working with Holocaust survivors from the former Soviet Union. Um, so generally, like I knew I wanted to work within the public sector. I just didn't know. I wasn't fully baked yet until I went to grad school. And so I went to Cal for my graduate program in public policy. And, you know, when I initially joined, I am what they called a generalist. Like I didn't really go in there knowing, oh, I wanted to do health or education or well, what energy, like a lot of my friends, I think kind of came in with a clear idea of which policy area they wanted to operate. And for me, I was very much uh, went into it pretty open-minded. And I think a lecture by one of my uh, first semester economics professors, at the time, who is a renowned uh, researcher in criminal justice, um, I, I think definitely just kind of, you know, uh, brought out kind of like the passion that I had for this one particular policy area being criminal justice. I remember the lecture was specifically on uh, black unemployment rate and how during the time of mass incarceration, like you can see the graphs, like the trends in the 20th century. And uh, he was showing the unemployment rate for black men, you know, went down significantly during that period. And there is a positive correlation between that and mass incarceration rate. Mm -hmm. And so, and it was a critical day because it was the day that I was supposed to fill out the project that I wanted to work on. And so at that point, I had no idea, but I just ran to my apartment and filled out the form um, to work with the San Francisco juvenile pr probation department and the rest is history. And that's how I kind of got started into criminal justice. That's beautiful. A point you touched on there in examining the data, you know, it's, uh, it's tough, but one of the things you have to ask yourself, right, is mm -hmm. I think it's, it's one of three things, right? If the racists are right, you know, there's some sort of biological problem 
with black men, and that's why this keeps happening. Uh, if the racists aren't right, then you have two other options, mm -hmm. either malignance on the part of the bureaucrats mm -hmm. or ignorance. Now, I assume you're not with the racists, so do you, do you think it's more kind of bad actors behind the scenes or they're doing things with unintended con consequences out of ignorance that are, that are leading to these disparities that you've mentioned? So I think um, I think a term that is most widely used nowadays, systemic racist policies. Um, I definitely do think there are intentions behind how a certain, some of the policy, you know, the policies came to be. Right. So if you were to kind of work backwards to kind of examine what led to that point in time, um, you know, you look at the crack epidemic and how crack cocaine was penalized versus regular cocaine. And you look at the three strikes initiative of, of 1994. Um, and you look at the disproportionate impact that it has on communities of color. Um, I mean, for the longest, definitely the black population, but now even the Latinx population. Um, and so, you know, like if you were, were to work backwards, you definitely see elements of those systemic racist policies uh, that have intent behind them. But obviously, like, I definitely don't want to reduce such a complex topic to say all of it was intentional. Perhaps there might be factors that might have been compounded by both intention and unintentional acts. And so, but if you were to kind of look at, I would say, a lion's share of the policies that contributed to mass incarceration uh, could be traced back to the crack epidemic and uh, the three strikes and you kind of see the shift in the paradigm shift that we're at right now, right? Like there's definitely another wave of you know, the opioid crisis that we're going, like, you know, we're experiencing through millennials, but it's not necessarily marginalized communities that are suffering the most from that now, right? And so you kind of see the shift away from um, those inner cities, blighted neighborhoods type narrative to more like, you know, suburbia and, more of like a widespread population being impacted by this. And you might say perhaps people are now more motivated to uh, take on a more rehabilitative approach because the demographics has shifted. Who knows, right? Um, whereas before somehow, like when it was disproportionately impacting, you know, communities that looked a certain way, there wasn't that, you know, gusto that we're at now to kind of like reform the way we think about it. It could be a number of things. I don't want to be conclusive, but definitely there were there were systemic racist policies before, be, you know, behind the way we came to be. As a That's fair. I, I like that. Yeah. For me, you know, growing up always in the communities I was in, always had a, a critical eye towards people like J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, Tricky Dick Nixon, the, the POTUS, and, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan, people who were explicit about some of their aims. But like you said, you know, sometimes bureaucracies are created that may have inherited these things and perhaps they are more innocent in their intention, even if the kind of fruit of their work or their labor ends up being the same so that it's, it, it can't be reduced, right? We, we can't be reductive about this, that, that it, it's a number of factors that combine to make a situation that that are leading to the riot. Some people say protests, some people say riots, some people say revolts that have been going on in the United States uh, two days. Uh, we're actually filming on September 23rd, although it'll be released later. And I've already seen some people upset with the the verdict in the Breonna Taylor case. And, and all of it is interesting because there is a lot of overlap between the people who want what they say is some form of justice for these these killings but some of their overlap is along with people who are looking for a more rehabilitative system so people who are in general calling for more rehabilitation but who might specifically want retribution towards the police versus people who want rehabilitation towards all people including the police and even some of the most you know um objectively horrendous members of the in incarcerated community, whether it be, you know, murderers or uh, child predators, uh, ghost eaters, as anonymous has, has called them. I think now would be a good time to enter the, the ballots. I have I have the, the names of the ballots and kind of summaries 
in front. Were there any specific propositions on the California ballot that, that caught your eye? I see a few of them related to criminal justice. Right. And so actually, before we get into the current ballot, you know, the initiatives that will be on the current November ballot, I wanted to kind of take, like, you know, take a step back mm -hmm. and assure people that even though it seems very much like doom and gloom uh, when it comes to like some of these like social, you know, justice, you know, uh, sphere in general, like, you know, whether it's criminal justice or whatever, uh, there has been a lot of progress made within the past 10 years alone, right? And mostly ushered by voters. And so I see a lot of people kind of losing heart saying, you know, my vote doesn't matter, like, what's the point? But you'd be surprised how, how many changes uh, have been brought upon because of voters who've, you know, who showed up. Um, and I would like to mention just a few of the past 10 years. And so um, just basic statistics, I think between 1978 and 1998, um, the California prisons grew by over 600% because of like, you know, crack epidemic, three strikes really contributed to that. And then- um, The super predators of the crime bill, all that good stuff. Oh yeah, all the good stuff. Uh, and since 2011, the population prisons has gone down to by 45%. And because huh? of reforms like AB 109 that uh, came about because of uh, prison overcrowding in 2011 was uh, California legislature and um, Governor Brown passed it. Um, and it shifted responsibilities of, um, uh, you know, supervising non-violent, non-sex and non-serious related offenses from the prison, from the state to the county. So uh, a lot of these individuals released on um, AB 109 on the, you know, terms of probation. Uh, so there's AB 109, there's Proposition 36 that modified the three strikes initiative. Uh, and then there's Proposition 47, my favorite. Uh, that one reduced penalties for the non-drug, uh, I mean, for um, drug and property related, but non, you know, violent offenses. Um, and, you know, kind of like focused on prioritizing using jail and prison space for those with higher level offenses. And so, um, and the beautiful aspect of this proposition is because the state, the state saved a lot of money from this reduction in prison population, they then use that money to give to different communities to put out programs to, in order to be able to um, increase pro, like, you know, services for these individuals. And so, so they, isolate, they isolate that money? It doesn't go into like a general pot? No, they um, have a body within the state, Board of State Community Corrections, that administer it. And um, they have divided it up and have given it to about 52 um, offices and county entities and, you know, nonprofits across Cal the state of California. And Los Angeles County definitely gets um, a good share of that pot. And, um, yeah, so they've, because of that, we've been able to put out programs that are able to link individuals to important programming that would break the cycle of incarceration. So those are kind of like a few to mention. Um, That's good, to give the people a little hope. <laughs> yeah, a little hope, like because of your uh, civic participation, change was able to happen. And I think Obama's um, piece that he wrote right when the George Floyd protests were happening comes to mind in that it's good to protest, but you need both protesting and politics, right? Like be sure to go out and vote. And a lot of, um, for those, you know, particularly interested in criminal justice, um, a lot of the criminal justice reforms happen at this at the local levels, like at the county and state levels. And so don't just focus on the presidential election, like the, you know, that I know tends to steal the show, but yeah. there are a lot that are, that could easily be going under the radar. And so just pay attention to those and reform happens at the local level, especially when it comes to criminal justice. So with that, I'm ready to dive in um, to the current ballot. So there are three that I wanted to speak on. Mm -hmm. okay. because there's like you know, many that touch on different categories, but three that I thought were relevant to my work that I have a say on. And just <laughs> before, before I get started, <laughs> disclaimer, the views, thoughts, opinions, you know, that I'm about to share are mine and mine only and not my employer. So just get that out of the way. Um, all right, so the first one is Proposition 25. Mm -hmm. um, I recommend a yes on that. It replaces the money bail system, you know, with a system for uh, pre-trial release for 
from jail based on public safety of flight risk and limits pretrial detention for most misdemeanors. Um, and many who operate within the sphere know the, not the notoriousness of the bail system. Yeah, um, let's talk about that a little bit because um, people, I think, have heard it as a slogan during these protests, but some people might have a little less technical knowledge than you about it. What does it mean to have cash bail versus risk assessment? And then again, really emphasize, so you're saying yes, and yes means this, and say what no would mean. Right. So yes would uh, replace the current system that relies heavily on cash bail, and um, meaning it would replace it with um, like the courts would establish a pretrial assessment division, which would classify suspects as low, medium, or high risk of not showing up to their court date and recommend conditions of release according to these results. So generally speaking, like someone who would be deemed low risk would be released and wouldn't be uh, you know, held accountable for coming up with a cash bail. Um, and so, yeah. So would rich people be offended by this where they used to be able to get off, but now they can't as easily? It definitely would equalize the playing field, right? So. <laughs> okay, what do you have for us? All right, so the next one is uh, Proposition 20. Mm -hmm. And I would recommend a no on that one because it definitely would reverse a lot of the um, reforms made within the past 10 years most notably those like Proposition 47 that I just mentioned. Um, it would allow judges to determine whether, if, 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 if it's passed, you know, it would allow judges, um, well, let me clarify myself, if it passed as a yes, it would allow judges to determine whether certain crimes like vehicle theft and or credit card fraud can be charged as felonies rather than um, automatically as misdemeanors. And it would add 51 crimes and sentences uh, which, you know, if committed would exclude that individual from a parole review program. And so, yeah, I would say no to Proposition 20 because it would definitely be uh, hindering the progress that we've been making. I'm genuinely surprised that one got on there. I wonder how in this climate like, something like that. There's a long history behind it. It's like the Cooper Ballot Initiative. Um, it's this really controversial man that introduced it. Um, and yeah, and anyone who's interested to learn more about these uh, propositions could definitely Google them and learn more about them. Mm -hmm. um, and the last one that I have is Proposition 17. And okay. I recommend a yes on that one. Uh, that would allow those who are on parole to vote. Currently, they're not eligible to vote. And so this one would allow them to vote. So I think that's it. I have like a couple more that have nothing to do with criminal justice, but indirectly could. Bonus ones, like I have two of them. Uh, proposition. Well, before you go to the bonus one, go I think it. we went over this one a little quickly. Okay. It may not be obvious to people why mm -hmm. convicted felons on parole should get the right to vote or suffrage. So why, why don't you give us an elevator pitch for that? Um, I, I find all these agreeable, by the way. I agree with all the ones that right. you're doing, and I've mentioned in another episode that I'm going to release, I right. am less interested in the presidential election. And I think if your only lens was criminal justice, even the presidential election is less clear than others would make it. If you have other issues, absolutely those other issues can take precedence. Okay. But if criminal justice was the sole lens, I think that race is actually less clear than some people are making it. And the um, the ballots, though, I think are are easier to get broader support, and right. I think less, less emotional attachment. Absolutely. Uh, and people are able to then you know isolate and look at these um, initiatives um, with a more clear lens, like without the too much politics kind of like blurring their judgment, right? Like just read it for what it is. Um, and so, yeah, as far as like, I think the last one that you wanted to discuss a bit more on, you know, voting is a right that not everybody gets to exercise. Um, and there are still restrictions, you know, this proposition doesn't like grant it to everybody. Like for example, those who are in prison still cannot vote, but those who've kind of done their time and um, have proven to be um, able to come out uh, should be able to have that right extended to them as well. Um, 
and you know many of them you know come back to communities and reintegrate back and face the uphill battle of having to uh, you know re-enter re society and having to reestablish themselves from scratch. And so I think our work definitely heavily relies on the ideology of second chance, right? Um, and so we do believe that more or less they definitely should have the right to exercise their uh, voices through that. And you know many of these initiatives and policies. Uh, that directly impact these populations uh, should be inviting these populations to the table to have a direct say on that, right? And so, and this kind of goes uh, for every other um, area out there that, you know, if you're about to uh, come up with a program that is going to impact a community, uh, you should definitely be inviting that community to the table. And so with the growing thirst that we have for criminal justice reform, the work is definitely going to be growing. Um, and so uh, we definitely want their voices represented um, during these voting elections. So, yeah. Well, well played. There's there's the, the argument on the other side, mostly I think from Republicans, right. that their fear is that it is a Democrat ploy because they're guessing that most of these people are just gonna vote Democrat and you're just trying to get more Democrat votes. What, what do you say to that devil's advocate person? I mean, um, I mean, like to, I mean, to begin with, we don't even know what their political stance is, right? Like you're just automatically generalizing that everybody who's specifically talking about this proposition, everybody who's on parole is likely to uh, vote for um, some of the policies that impact them. I would say, I think inherently that kind of speaks to the fear that, you know, the other side may have as far as like the more progressive socialist type policies that uh, are, um, that promise a more equitable society. And so I would say, so be it. You know what I mean? Like if these people are uh, realizing that um, these propositions are definitely going to be impacting their communities. And if that happens to be democratic, maybe that's saying something good about the democratic uh, party, right? Um, and so, but yeah, I uh, would say for naysayers like that, I think that exists for every initiative out there as far as like the bipartisan aspect. Um, and so you just would have to decide for yourself. I mean, it is what it is. It's like I, I have a, a far more controversial point of view on suffrage writ, writ large. Mm -hmm. However, I agree with you that if we have suffrage, we need to extend it logically. And I, I would personally, if we have it, extend it to those in prison too, because there's, there's nothing threatening. Like even in the most, unless you're just like the most retributive person, um, I, I doesn't, it doesn't seem like you would literally harm somebody with your vote. So it doesn't, I can't see any logical reason why even if we have the technology we have in this day, why people in prison can't even vote themselves. But, but I'll, I'll save you from uh, having that position yourself by having it. And uh, you're, you had bonus, you had bonus propositions you wanted to look at. I still have them in front of me as well. Yeah, two. So yes, on proposition 15, uh, that one would be closing a tab loophole for um, commercial properties and generating, it could potentially generate up to like $14 billion, which would then be funneled towards um, funding schools and community services. Um, and so a yes on Proposition 15, and then uh, a yes on Proposition 16, that one has to do with affirmative action. Um, again, so I think- that one is That one is more controversial. That one, 15, I understand that people are just going to vote on that basically on what their view of taxes are. And we know that that's different by the person. The affirmative action one, um, I've seen the anti-racist school, people led by the likes of uh, Ibrahim Hindi. And then I've seen the sort of center left a black crew and including some conservative blacks critique it as um it's a it's a questioning of the like you use the word equity, which is interesting, right? I think it's the fundamental difference between people's idea of equality versus equity. And so before, like the way the the law and the books is, is that based on the protected categories of of so-called race, sex, color, ethnicity, national origin, mm -hmm. the state cannot 
discriminate or grant preferential treatment. And so now you're saying the yes would repeal that or the or is the no? The yes would bring back affirmative action. Okay. So so tell us about that. Um so on that one I um let me see. I would actually prefer I would um redirect folks to kind of read up on it themselves. I mm -hmm. not say much about it. Um, okay. But I would say like, I think from a philosophical perspective, um, I know that's kind of been a controversy even in the way like schools admit uh, students, right? And so yeah. for me, like if the starting point is not equal, uh, then that ultimately for me justifies an affirmative action uh, to make, you know, decisions like, you know, as a, as a criteria to make decisions. And so I would, um, yeah, I would have, I would suggest folks read up on it themselves. Yeah. I can't. It's, it is certainly, I think, counterintuitive. And I understand the zeitgeist behind both sides because right. the, the kind of classic argument, right. And, and maybe we just have to admit in a public way, the classic argument has failed. The classic argument, the kind of Martin Luther King is to get the state not to discriminate. And so that 1996 law says the state cannot discriminate. But if we say, you know, after, you know, 20 years or so that the not discrimination has actually led to more discrimination in a sense, then the way to overturn that is to allow the state to correct it by allowing the state to discriminate. And so, like you said, we're going to just suggest everyone do further reading. I, I think I think it's a it's a complex uh, question. I don't I don't even think I have fully formed thoughts on it, but I have seen intelligent people actually disagree on this one, and that and that's why I I asked you about that. That's really cool. Definitely. Yeah. So I guess now we can we can do a plug. Sali Tamirat, uh, to use her full Gutz name invited me earlier to join a new Gutz program and I was so excited. People have probably heard me say the word Gutz a million times on this program and uh, congrats for you. You're going to keep hearing it. Today I actually heard in the news today again September 23rd that the Tigray region of Ethiopia has just said that they're going to be Im um, imbuing all of their elementary school students with Gutz knowledge as well, and I'm excited about that. So, Saalit, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Mak the Makanat Ababat uh, program? Mak Makanat Ababat, by the way, means the place of of wisdom or wisdoms or art pieces. So, tell us a little bit about that program, how you got into it, and why. Um, so it's funny you mentioned that because, um, by the way, shout out to was it Haywan, uh, one of the featured guests from previous sessions. Yeah. Um, so I think the way I got into it definitely was not like by mere chance or accident. I think for the longest I've, one of like, I've mentioned to everybody, one of, I changed my major five times as an undergrad. And one of the ones that I almost, um, you know, declared was an independent major that I was cooking up with one of my professors in somatic philology. And so I had this fantasy growing up of like Indiana Jones and like, you know, uh, deciphering ancient texts and all of that really exciting stuff and you know I thought Giz is such a mystical language and I was definitely very much intrigued about you know um, studying it um, but alas that didn't happen and you know hearing Heiwan was very therapeutic for me because I was kind of living vicariously through her experiences but um, so yeah so I too like in my 20s I had this idea in my head like it would be nice to study goods but I didn't know where to get started you know it could be very intimidating um just kind of to do it on my own mostly because I tend to not be as disciplined as you Hanok I definitely admire your amazing self will like you know the will that you have to stick to a program and to you know educate yourself um and to learn Amharic and now Giz from scratch on your own. So that's very impressive to me. So I didn't have that kind of like self-discipline. So when this thing came about, like uh, he started it recently, like this past summer, my sister-in-law is enrolled in it because my nieces and nephew, my niece and nephew are um, enrolled kind of like in a program that um, our teacher uh, teaches and uh, they've been reciting and memorizing with Dasi Mariam. And I think they're now on Thursday. 
Um, and so I kind of knew that there was this movement, like a reawakening of interest and good is kind of happening everywhere. And when this opportunity came about, I'm like, okay, this is the best shot that I have to finally realize my childhood dream of learning GIS in a structured environment that would kind of, you know, set me up for success versus if I were to just do it on my own. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. So, I mean, and you said I'm, I'm disciplined. I think I'm disciplined on some of the things I can motivate myself, but in others, I'm not. Like, I'll tell you, I'm super disciplined in, in terms of uh, trying to pick up you know, improve my Amharic. I have to shout out my parents because they're the ones who gave me the foundation. But certainly to improve my Amharic, that's that's self-motivation. And, and to begin to learn is that's self-motivation. Nobody compelled me to do that. But for example, I know the benefits of, of yoga and stretching. And I, I stretch almost every day. But the last time I sat there and actually stretched for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, or even 90 minutes, it might be a few years, you know, and I know the benefits of doing that. But the, the kind of structure, like you said, of an actual organized classroom is is what I would need to do yoga more. So I think it it's just a matter of what the subject matter at, at hand is, could you give us any gursha of anything that you've learned so far? I'm going to give everybody the links. I'll, I'll link to the episode I did with uh, Hewan Simon, who's the Ethiopianist in Germany. It's called, uh, I think it's Humor and Music, but I'll, I'll link to it. I'll also link to Balladopedia so people could look at the propositions. And I'll link to Makana Tababat's YouTube page as well as their, their online in case there's a short window of, I think, about 10 more days or so before people will be able to sign up. But at least if they can't get this round, they'll be able to get a next round. Because I imagine that this is eventually going to build out into an institute and and continue teaching people in, in North America and all over. I saw one child in Kenya. Uh, as well, kind of learning. So, um, any any gurshas of anything that you've you've learned so far in your in your brief tenure? Well, it's only been two months, so we have not uh, started learning actual definitions, but rather reading, right? Um, because in is there are things that you uh, end with, like uh, tennis. What would be the closest English translation to that? So we have like four ways to end. So I can give you, I guess, examples of that. So something that would end with a tenish would be samaya. Like, you know, you can uh, you can kind of see the my voice going down and up like samaya. And then uh, there's what we call wadaki. Uh, an example of a wadaki would be um, anything that ends with rabi, uh, like, you know, the the seven columns, like giz, kabit, salis, rabit. Um, Hamis, uh, Salis, and Sadis, right? Like, so the fourth category, like Ha, Hu, He, Ha, He. So, any one of the ones that end with a He are usually Wadaki. So, maybe Gabre. So, you can hear my voice like Gabre. Um, I would say that's the second voice that we learn. So, in, in reading like these texts, we have to identify how to end, like the, the, the note by which we need to end each word. And then we have Sayyaf, right? Sayyaf's kind of like diagonal, kind of like tennis, but it's more diagonal. Um, and usually words that end in um, sadis, like the six, uh, I guess, I don't know what, like the six oh. categories, like a column, right? Um, and with a, a, but not all of them end with a sayyaf. Some of them could be tatai, meaning they're kind of like wadaki, but more like dragged. Um, mm -hmm. So an example of sayyaf would be gabriel. Um, that would be Sayyaf. And then um, another example of that I would be Mikael. So whenever we're mentioning the names of the two angels, Gabriel is usually done with a Sayyaf, like Gabriel, whereas Mikael is Mikael, that I don't ask me why. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like Mariam, Christos, all of these are that I, Awelos, uh, Gabriel, um, Sayon, like these ones are Sayyaf. Oh. This is wonderful. And, and and we have to just throw it out there. So you talk about how you couched this dream from, from yesteryear and how you're kind of no longer having to live vicariously to other Ethiopianists, but now you're beginning your own Ethiopianist journey oh, on God. the side, Thank right? God. Right. Thank God. <laughs> it was like a moment. I was having like a rough moment when I realized, I think when I was uh, going through my fantasies in my late teens and early 20s, um, the movement wasn't as uh, reawakened as I see it now. 
And so like, you know, a few years down the road, I'm, I started seeing all these people learning it. And then I'm like, okay, what am I waiting for? And so, um, you know, I'm very happy that I have this opportunity through Makan at Tababad. And I, the, the point I just want to make, and I think it's a good one to, to close on is like, you didn't have zero guz knowledge before you entered. Now people are going to enter with various amounts of knowledge into learning and everybody, wherever they're at, they can improve. But can you talk about just, you know, your experience throughout your life, hearing guz at various times and, and places? I can think of one obvious place where you probably heard it the most, but uh, I'm, I'm sure there are other places as well. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the Ethiopian liturgy uh, still uses giz, our that's kind of like our Latin, right? Like, so the masses and giz and mahalates, the different haimano, like, uh, you know, worshipping songs that we use within the Ethiopian Orthodox Church use giz. And so I've just kind of like, my soul <laughs> has heard it so many times. Um, and uh, I mean, I have the advantage of being a native Amharic speaker too, right? So then I know how to read it, even though I may not understand everything. Uh, mm -hmm. I know how to read it and I know how to write it. So I'm kind of like, I think, at an advantage than someone who's learning it from scratch, for sure. So right now I just need to work on, and hopefully this class will grant me the ability to recognize some of the grammar. And as far as like the vocabulary, I think it's something that I would have to also build on my own because there's so much you can learn in a class. I have to put in that, that self-discipline I think is gonna come in here where I have to dedicate you know, a certain amount of time every day to just kind of learn the vocabulary as well. And, you know, also be familiar with the grammar. And I plan to use um, supplemental books for that. But I think Magabe is hopefully um, going to be teaching us how to start with Nibab. Just he's following the same thing that they do back home, like in Abinet Mertvetuch. You know, they get them to start reading these texts. And I think we're going to transition to Dawit. Um, because, you know, this is a very complex, nuanced language. Um, you know, the same word can mean different things depending on how you say it. Um, and um, so, yeah, so I think the nabab is very crucial and critical in Giz, which I think is why we, we're starting from that. Agreed, agreed. And and it's so important for people to know the the word nabab or, or mimbab in Giz as it means to read, but specifically in the context that she's talking about, it's reading out loud, it's recitation. And that's because there was so long where you had so many people in the in the population who were illiterate and you had little access to binding and actual books. Everything is, you know, goat skin, brana, it's handwritten by by monks and by Deptara, who are the 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 class of non-monastic people who are copying these texts as well. So you have to read it out loud and then you get corrected. So she knows how to read it, meaning she knows the alphabet, but she's getting corrected and everyone else is getting corrected to yeah. make sure that it, it follows the the up, which is the tanesh, the diagonal up, the sayyaf, the diagonal down, the tatai, and the down, the the wadaki, as she as she described it okay. earlier. And uh, I've I've gotten pretty good at it myself, but <laughs> I'm I'm not in kanyelish. Actually, speaking with uh, Magabit about, he was telling me you're not in kanyelish yet, or he's he said you're not without spot, you're not blameless yet. So uh, there are a few of them I I still need to work on. So I'm I'm glad to join the foundational class and then go through the um the psalms of david or the dawit as you mentioned and eventually i want to i want to sign up for the kane class or the good poetry class when there's when there's time but yeah thank you so much is there any other final parting words of advice for good or for politics or or anything else you want to plug before we head out uh vote because your voice matters and you could definitely make uh change happen and criminal justice reform so yeah if you are red and if you're not registered register the vote um, as far as Giz, um, I mean, anybody who's interested in learning and registering in this class, you can contact Hanuk. And I don't even know if they're going to cap the class, but I mean, there's no slowing down, right? Like, and you, you have grand visions. Our teacher for that class has grand visions. So I'm excited for the renaissance that Giz is experiencing right now. Amen. Um, yeah.